Hello and welcome to this Interact Central Europe webinar on the first call for project proposals. I hope you had a good start into the new year with fresh motivation to cooperate beyond borders for a better Central Europe. Time is moving fast. Two months ago, we opened our call and six weeks have passed since our first live Q&A webinar took place. In that two hour event in early December, we already answered many of your questions regarding the application process and project development. Today, we want to follow up on this just five weeks before our call closes on Wednesday, the 23rd of February. Like in the previous webinar, we will begin with more general questions before we then dive deeper into the work plan and budget development. Before we start, let me introduce myself. I'm Frank Schneider, Head of Communications at the Interact Central Europe Programme. I will guide you through the next two hours with three specific Q&A rounds. In each round, your questions will be answered by experienced colleagues of mine from the Joint Secretariat. Let's now take a brief look at these sessions. In the first Q&A round, we will look into the general framework of the new program and the first call. We will also try to discuss the thematic scope and relevance of project proposals with you. In the second round, we will then look deeper into the project work plan development before we finally look into project budget development and state aid issues. Before we now come to your questions, let me briefly remind you that we are recording this webinar and that we will upload it to our YouTube playlist as soon as possible. This will give you a chance to revisit all answers given by my colleagues whenever you need them the most. As you can see in the Slido tool to your right, many of you already sent in questions in advance. You can post your additional questions there at any time in the next two hours. If you want to, you can also upvote other questions there. Last but not least, let me maybe point out a limitation of today's event. I am afraid that we might not be able to answer all your questions in the next two hours. We will simply not have enough time. So if your question is not addressed today, you can also send it in per email to our help desk at helpdesk at interact-central.eu and we will get back to you individually. Or if it is a more specific question, you can also discuss this with my colleagues in an individual consultation, which we offer to all lead applicants until the 11th of February on this platform as well. So before we now start with the first round of your questions, I would have two questions for you to get to know you better. Let's look at the first one in the slide or two. Did you attend our first Q&A webinar in December? So I can see the answers coming in, 50 answers already, 60. Many of you have attended the first Q&A webinar, 90 answers still. There is the vast majority that has been with us in the December webinar as well. Some watch the recording, so that's very good news. It's worth the effort to put it there. Maybe you did both. So 250 answers, half, a bit more than half of you have uh, attended uh, the first webinar already. So that's good to hear. And for those that have not attended the first webinar or not even watched the recording of the first webinar yet, we are not going to take the same questions. We are trying to uh, move on in this webinar and take new questions, additional questions. So if you have the feeling that a certain question is not answered, even though you put it into Slido, it might be that it was answered in the first webinar. So please have a look at the recording and, um, and you might find the answer there or address the help desk, as I said. So maybe a second question, let's see. Are you planning to request a consultation with us, with one of my program officer colleagues? So we have four possibilities to answer there. Yes, I already had the consultation. I have already booked one. 
I am play planning to request it very soon. As I said, the deadline for that is the 11th of February. And it's not only the deadline, it's the very last day on which we offer a consultation. And no, I'm not interested in a consultation. As you know, they are not compulsory in this call. So let's have a look into the answers. That's uh, very interesting for us. Nearly 200 answers. And most of you are still planning to request the consultation. I can tell you, we have already more than 50 consultation requests on our desks. Uh, we have held a few consultations already, so don't wait until the last minute. If you're planning to, um, just go ahead, uh, contact us here on this platform and request the consultation. So I think now with 235 people submitting an answer, the picture is not changing much. Many of you are also not interested. I would nevertheless we. Uh, recommend uh, to, to search a uh, consultation if you're in doubt with certain issues. It doesn't have to last for 45 minutes. It can also be just 10 minutes if you have only one very specific question that is not answered anywhere else. So that might also be worth it. Um, but if you feel uh, safe and secure with your process, uh, of uh, applying with us, then obviously you do not also have to uh, meet with us. You can also ask the national contact points, of course. Let's uh, not forget that there's also the support on the national level. So thank you for your feedback. And let's now start with the first round without further ado. So in this first round, as I said, we will look into the general framework of the new program and the first call. And we will take questions on the thematic scope and relevance of project proposals. We have a few key experts for you. The first one is Luca Ferrarese, our head of uh, Joint Secretariat. He will be supported on the thematic questions by Jana Valkova for innovation topics, Victoria Dobravets for energy topics, Luba Jusko for environment, Winfried Ritt on transport, and Christoph Ebermann on governance. So let's have a look at a very first question. So the very first question is, how important is the policy impact for an Interact Central Europe project? Do you expect projects to make measurable change to policy documents, or should the focus be on the implementation of practical measures? For this question, for this very first one, I will ask Luca Ferrarese to join me. Hello, Luca. Hi, Frank. Hi. Hello to all. Hello. So you are with me here in the office. Uh, that's not the normal situation, I guess, all across Central Europe. But for today, we are together here advising our applicants on these crucial questions. So maybe there, will, there are so many, Luca. You have seen it. I mean, more than 50 questions were sent in in advance. There's more questions coming in constantly. So let's start with the first one. So what about the policy impact? Yeah, first of all, of course, it's nice to be here and also to be somehow in the office and looking forward to have maybe some other occasions to meet also our applicants in person said this let's start with a question basically uh, i mean what has to be kept in mind is that the basic of our project is cooperation is transnational cooperation transnational cooperation can result and can bring to policy improvement policy support even better if we have uh, policy driving as it is proposed in this question, but can be also implementation oriented. So we can test uh, on the ground solutions, innovative solutions. A project can be more focusing on policy support. A project can be also more focusing on implementation or a project can combine the two approaches into one single project. It depends on what the project aims, but as I said, Keep in mind that whatever you do with the project, the starting point is cooperation. 
Thank you, Luca. I think that's very clear. So we will have a nice mix, hopefully, after the first call um, of projects focusing on various issues. Um, linked to the policy impact somehow. Um, I guess most in the audience will be familiar with macro regional strategies. There is a question, do we make or shall we make reference to old macro regional strategies like the Danube and Alpine since new ones were not adopted yet? Um, is there anything like an old macro regional strategy at all, Luca? What do you think? Well, uh, I hope colleagues from macro regional strategies are not here now because they might get some concerns. But anyway, the there are no old macro regional strategies. The macro regional strategies are still there and they are rene renewing, renewing and going on. And hopefully they will uh, continue delivering as they are doing now already. So uh, the reference to the macro regional strategies like Danube, the Alpine, but also the Adriatic, the Union, and uh, it's, it's in the Baltic, of course, it's crucial for us. And, Anyway, the contribution of a project to these strategies needs to be described if the project is doing that. Of course, there should not be like a, a, an artificial attempt to describe a contribution to something with which the project is not contributing to. Uh, the contribution to the macro regional strategies is also part of a, a wider picture because projects are requested to contribute to other strategies which are of key importance in the European level. And there is a special section in the application form in which you have the possibility to describe these contributions. Thank you, Luca. The next question is an interesting one because we have this partner type called associated partner. And the question is, if I want to be an associate partner, what kind of obligations do I have and what kind of benefits uh, will I have as an associated partner in a project partnership? Well, uh, first of all, it's important to remind what is an associated partner. An associated partner is basically or should be one, a, a key stakeholder for the project. So it's an organization which is very much interested into the project results which wants to take up the project results and bring uh, like durability and long-term perspective to the project results, but is not receiving funding from the project. So uh, the point is that it's up to the project to define what is and which is the best associated partner. To have associated partners is not a must. Things can change also during project implementation. However, an associated partner basically has no obligation. Still, when you uh, uh, indicate an associated partner in your application form, you should be aware that this associated partner should have a role. And this you are required, required to describe this role in the project, why that organization is an associated partner and not another one. And this is possible in the partner description, section B of the application form, but also throughout the work plan, you have the opportunity to describe the involvement of, of your target groups in your project activities. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next question, Luca, also a general one, um, maybe not that general anymore. It's about intellectual property. So the question is, who does the intellectual property of an output belong to? Does it belong to the partner who developed it or to the whole consortium? Well, this is, uh, I would say, a very important question, especially in these times in which projects are requested to be even more innovative. And being more innovative and have uh, uh, new findings and new tools, for example, which are very good and very innovative, could also lead to an exploitation, a commercial exploitation, why not? So, for that quest, for this question, I would strongly recommend uh, the applicants to have a look to the model of subsidy contract, which is also available on our website. On Article 15 of the subsidy contract, there is a specific provision concerning ownership and use of outputs. It says that the uh, ownership of this, uh, of whatever is created in the project, remains with the partners and within the partnership in compliance with national rules and national laws on the matter. Uh, within the partnership, how this is dealt, it's up to the partnership as such. So 
in the in the partnership agreement, which is also this document that is signed between all the partners before starting the implementation of the project, the partnership should agree if they need to, they should agree on how the property is uh, is addressed and how the property is dealt within the partnership. It could stay shared between partners. It could stay with the partner which created it. It depends on what the partners agree between them, always in compliance with national rules on the matter. Keep in mind that anyway, we are not research projects. In our case, our projects are normally implementing outputs and activities with the co through the cooperation between more partners. So it's somehow you have to be careful on that because very, very likely your output is not developed by one partner only, but, but my, by more partners. So this is something you need to discuss within your partnership. That's the beauty of cooperation. That's what uh, sets us apart a little bit. The next question is also on uh, partnership and uh, in a different uh, sense. And here the question is, we have some certain recommendations on partnership size overall, like how big should a consortium be? And the question is, uh, is there a limitation for the number of partners from one and the same country? Well, <clears throat> no, we don't set any share or percentage or number of partners which should come from here or from there. Everything has to be justified within the project. We have in the term of reference for the call, well described in detail or our assessment criteria. In there, there is a nice session devoted to partnership. This is also reflected in the self-assessment tool, which I warmly recommend you to fill in before finalizing your project, because you might discover interesting things when you answer to these questions. And one of, the, <clears throat> one of these questions concerns the partnership. And there you will find that uh, projects which have a balanced partnership are likely to better fit to our assessment questions. So please, uh, uh, whatever you do, when you establish your partnership, it has to be justified, it has to make sense, it has to be, uh, let's say, reflecting the transnational cooperation approach that our projects are expected to produce in order to be funded. Thank you, Luca. The next one, uh, the next question I find quite interesting. We have been promising simplification for so many years and now i think we have simplified quite a bit but out there our applicants that are now following us luca are a bit surprised maybe that we don't don't ask for a long list of mandatory attachments anymore that need to be uploaded with a proposal or maybe i'm wrong maybe there there are not that many anymore there are a few i understand but i leave the answer to you where do you upload all the mandatory attachments uh, that need to be uploaded with the proposal, or are there none anymore? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, we tried to reduce paperwork and formal aspects to the possible extent. Still, I mean, I always say uh, when I speak with, with organizations interested in applying, uh, I always say, remember that when you apply, for a loan at the bank, they ask you like two kilos of documents. So we are giving money here. And basically what we ask is a document signed by each applicant, including the lead applicant. So the formal obligation is to produce this lead partner and partner declarations. Uh, you find the information on that on chapter, in section two, chapter 214 of the program manual, which is called additional documents. And this is it. This is what you have to provide when you apply for funding and when you submit your project proposal through the application form. Of course, in case you are a private lead applicant, there, is, there are also additional documents that you have to submit. And in this chapter, I just mentioned, I repeat, section two, 
chapter 214 of the program manual, additional documents, you find the list of documents that privately the applicants have to submit. But as you correctly said, Frank, it's not much. Beware that <clears throat> in case uh, 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 your project is failing in submitting documents, there might be a problem with eligibility of the project. So please check carefully in the program manual in the section uh, devoted to uh, project assessment. Please check what are these requirements and what, is in, and what happens if some of these are missing. For example, the lead partner has to sign the, uh, the declaration. Otherwise, there is a problem of eligibility. All declarations have to be provided. If you don't do it, the, pro the project is not eligible. But this is it. That's it. I would say is not much. It's the minimum that an applicant should pay attention before submitting. And I suppose it will also become clearer once we have launched uh, the electronic submission system uh, at the end of uh, January, where to do this and how to do this, Luca. Absolutely, in GEMS, it will be easy to submit. The important thing is that we don't expect to receive any paper through post. Basically, uh, whatever you is requested to submit as listed in the program manual is in digital format as a scan and you can upload on the platform and that's it. Maybe, um, I'm just afraid I opened Pandora's box right now, dropping the name Gems uh, that you must have read and uh, since you know it is not there yet. So maybe just an announcement at this stage. We uh, are going to uh, launch the electronic uh, monitoring system as planned uh, towards the end of January and we will then also on the 4th of February follow up with a webinar like this one focused on the technical issues you might have with jams, uh, understanding where in which section you will have to do what. There will be a tutorial before that, uh, which you can watch uh, a walk through the platform. So um, we are not planning to answer or take any questions on jams today because we are still implementing it ourselves. Uh, you know, this is um, a work in progress. Uh, across Europe. And um, so don't worry, there will be more support following on GEMS very soon. Link to the um, project partners again. There is a question, uh, what if the legal status of an organization changes? Let's say the question here is very concretely, uh, project partner is um, an entity that was until recently part of a bigger uh, entity um, has a parent company, but is newly independent as a subsidiary entity. So does this play a role? Is this an advantage, a disadvantage? Um, Luca, how do you see this? Well, we are going already in details here. And um, so to say, I mean, the question is, are we assessing whether this, comp this organization participating as a partner in the project has a previous history. Basically, we are not assessing this. However, be, please keep in mind what you are signing. When you submit your project proposal, you are signing a partner declaration. In the partner declaration, you declare under your own responsibility, subject also to penal law, that you have among others, the capacity to implement the project, to face uh, uh, pre-financing, the need that to, to pay in advance costs that will be then late, only later reimbursed by the project program. So keep in mind the responsibilities and the duties you are accepting when you submit the project proposal with us. Therefore, if your organization is newly established, you can still participate as a partner, no problem. However, Keep in mind that you have to face then uh, uh, obligations. And therefore, if you don't have a good structure behind your organization, this could be a problem. It's a different thing if you are a lead partner. If you are a lead partner, as you will see in the self-assessment tool and in the time of reference for the first call, there is a specific question or, or set of questions concerning the experience of the lead partner. Managing an inter-transnational project or any international projects with 10, 11, 12 partners coming from five, six countries is all but not easy. 
Therefore, it's important that the lead partner has the capacity to, uh, to uh, manage these projects. That's why for the lead partner, there is a special section in which we ask questions on how the lead partner is able and which track record the lead partner has in managing such projects. With this, I don't want to discourage organizations which never applied with Interreg Central Europe to become a lead partner. They can do it, but still keep in mind that being a lead partner requests quite some responsibilities. And therefore, you need to have a good structure and good capacity and, of course, knowledge. A bit of experience uh, never hurts. So you're talking about uh, questions that touch on detail quite a bit already, Luca. Then the next one is really for you. <laughs> if a public equivalent body is also involved in supporting businesses through its own incubators, is it correct to insert option 11, business support organizations, in the application form as a type of partner? Uh, yes. However, uh, keep in mind that if an organization is doing many things, you should categorize your organization with the prevalent aim and scope, also in compliance with, the, with your constitutory act or your statute. So, what is the mission of the organization? What is the prevalent business of this organization? Therefore, this prevalency principle should apply when you select the type of partner which is listed in the next one. Thank you, Luca. Next question is uh, an interesting one. I find it's, uh, if I may uh, put it like this, uh, it has to do with lobbying, or if you don't like that word, with a bit of public political advocacy. So there is the question, will there be an option to attach also letters of support to the application or letters of support, uh, or do they not bring an added value at all? No, no option to attach these letters. They don't bring any added value. We are not looking into that, even if you, if you attach it. So this is just not needed. We are just assessing what we have in the application form. Please invest your efforts in drafting a good application form. Okay, thank you, Luca. We are now elevating a little bit again. We go back from the very detailed level. So the next question is, should a partnership in a project be built from several cities or just one for greater transparency? Well, this question could be understood in different meanings. I mean, uh, because it's not about, I would say, extra transparency to have to decide how the, to compose the partnership. The partnership has to be composed by the organizations that are actually working in the project. So if it is a municipality, which is close to a big city, but is the municipality which is doing the actual job, I think it should be the municipality. Uh, also being partner has responsibilities and requires commitment. So the principle is involving the partnership, those people that are actually doing things in the project. Then, of course, uh, it's better, uh, uh, it's better to, to somehow um, also have a look to the quantity of partners you involve in the project, because to have a project with 30 partners that would be maybe complicated. So also in this case, please define the, the role of the partners and the roles of associated partners, which are key stakeholders. So maybe one bigger city could be the partner if they are then really working in the project. And then the, the, the neighboring cities could be key stakeholders, so associated partners, but you need to look on a case by case basis. Thank you, Luca. I think I will give you a short break because we have a thematic question. <laughs> so thank you for the moment. And the next question is actually on innovation. So I would like to ask Jana. Hello, Jana, to join me. Good morning, Jana. Good morning, Frank. Good morning to the audience. So Jana, the thematic question, uh, I think you have seen it before. So it has to do with the overall description of SO 1.1, which is focused on increasing competitiveness. 
In the concrete topics, social inclusion is also mentioned. Is competitiveness a necessary component of any submission targeting this section SO 1.1? Well, the question is not fully sharp or fully clear, but I must say, um, in general, SO11 is focusing um, on developing and supporting frameworks and linkages and collaboration in order to increase S3 performance in the regions. So, of course, this links also to increasing competitiveness and the ability of businesses, SMEs, starting businesses to really compete and and take on board innovative and innovation and technology new technological solutions um so that the, really their business performance improves however if you wish to work also on on topics that focus more on um social innovation or that focus more on supporting social businesses clearly the social dimension might be more underlined and more visible in the application form than the strive for competitiveness. But the bottom line for all the projects that focus on supporting businesses, whether it's standard businesses or social businesses, um, is that it should lead to their better performance and um, in the end also better competition. So that's also, um, let's say, the per performance of businesses in Central Europe is um, is getting closer to the performance of businesses um, in, in um, other parts of Europe, so that we are supporting cohesion in that sense. Thank you, Jana. I think um, even though you said like the question might not be that clear, from what I understand, I think you answered this perfectly well. Um, hopefully, the uh, applicant out there who asked this, it's. Um, I was just checking whether there was a name to it, but I think it was anonymously. Um, I hope the answer um, was uh, sufficient for that. Otherwise, we might want uh, to see a follow up. So the next question, Luca, this is again for you. It's a very general one. Welcome back. So is Interact Central Europe the right funding for traditional beverage and fruit spirit producers that aim at overseas exports? So it's kind of linked to a, a competitiveness, probably. Yeah, maybe it's also for Jana. No, I would say it's not really the, the, the aim. We are a program in the cohesion policy. We are working for regional disparities. And basically, I don't really see uh, this type of initiatives, which are really very much business oriented. On top of it, we have some also limitations linked to support to export uh, given from state aid. So I would say from what I see here, I wouldn't really go for Central Europe in this field. Thank you, Luca. I think it's also important to, to understand where the limits are of uh, cooperation in Central Europe and, and which direction to go. Um, we have a very last question. And then this would be it uh, for the general uh, part. So if there are more questions coming in afterwards, we might want to bring you back, Luca. But uh, for the time being, this next question is the last one for this session. So when a project um, could realistically impact more than one specific objective, is it correct that this project proposal should focus on the most relevant and one and justify this choice? Or should they also justify somewhere else why they have not selected the secondary, not so much focused on specific objectives? So uh, if you have if you touch on more than one specific objective, what shall you do? Well, <clears throat> I think this question nicely bridges to the next session as well. And um, of course, a project has to focus on one specific objective. However, how the link with other specific objectives should be described, I would ask my colleague, my colleagues from the work plan side, maybe Monica, to join and to maybe complete the answer. Hello, thank you very much. A very good morning also from my side. 
So yeah, indeed, that's a very interesting question. As Luca already said, um, for us, it's very important that projects are very much focused on one um, specific objective. But I say, however, since we are also very much appreciating integrated approaches, which means that projects, they are not purely um, um, directed towards um, one topic, but they are also addressing other topics as well in a very integrated way. And I would see the space where this could be described in the application form actually in the, in the approach, in the, in the thematic in, um, section there, where um, applicants have to describe the way um, they want to address the topics, they want to address their objectives, um, and where they have to describe the methodology and the approach. And this means how, um, how different aspects of the objective are being addressed. And I would very much appreciate or welcome if this information is, is put there. But as a main message, um, project should be focused and not trying to address everything. Um, and there is, since I see also whether the, there is the question that there, whether there needs to be a justification why other SOs have not been selected, so this is not required, man. This is not required. So please just concentrate on the one SO which you have selected as the main, as the most important one. Thank you very much, Monica, for this. Um, so this is the end of the first session. Luca has kind of like sneaked out of this. So uh, thank you, Luca, without seeing you. There you are. Thank you very much again for uh, taking the time more than half an hour of intense questioning are over for you. And um, with that, we are now moving into the second round. And in this second question and answer round, we will look into the project work plan development. Here, our key experts are Monika Schöner-Grasser, who you have just seen, uh, our Head of Monitoring and Evaluation, and her colleague Christoph Ebermann, the Deputy Head of Monitoring and Evaluation. So let's start with the first question. And we are back to the work plan. There seems to be no field in the work plan part of the application form in which to indicate the work package coordinator. Is this information of work package coordinator who's going to coordinate uh, the work there not relevant or must it be indicated elsewhere? So Monica, if you would like to come back, hello. Hello. Um, yeah, I think that's, a very interesting and a very good question, because this is all linked to project management and project management, as we have seen also in the past in in all projects is a very crucial aspect. And in this respect, in the management, there is a clear and a very important role of the work package leaders. But as you have correctly seen in the new in the application form of the new program, there is not such a field required in the work plan any longer. So we had this in the past and where we were asking for this information. But since we um, did a lot of simplification in the work plan, where actually the uh, management and communication work packages, they don't exist any longer in the work plan, this information on the on the management, on the, on the structure, how to actually coordinate um, project activities, this is now found in the section um, C7, which is a text box where um, all the coordination structures and responsibilities of partners should be defined. So I therefore would recommend uh, really very strongly that you indicate in this section of C7 of the application form, how you plan to coordinate both at pro a project level, but also at work package level. And in addition to this um, section C7, where you can place this information on the work package coordination, there is also, of course, the partnership section, where you have to describe for each of the project partners the specific role. 
So this means if one partner acts as work package leader or work package one, whatever, please also describe this role clearly there and also justify why you think that this partner is really qualified to, um, to lead this work package and to coordinate the other partners. Thank you, Monica. The next question, we had a similar question in the first webinar, but I think it's good that we take it up once more because there is obviously something new. We do not have work packages for management and communication anymore. And this leads to some questions and maybe also some confusion because not where do you put the activities then? Where do you put project management activities, especially communication we will touch on later? Um, do you put them into the work packages that you have? Uh, do you put there a steering committee? Do you put there financial management? Or how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. Again, a very good question. As I pointed out before, management is a very crucial um, um, activity within the project. But however, we wanted really to simplify the work plan and the application form. And this is the reason why we took out the previous management and communication work packages. And, um, and this means that such management activities, like um, the setting up of a steering committee or, or the organization of project management meetings, they do not need to be included as activities anymore in the work plan. So I again point out, um, to the section C7 in the application form. This is the place where you have to explain um, the structure which you set up um, as it was said, the steering committee, for instance, and also the types of meetings you plan, the frequency of meetings, maybe also whether you plan to do them online or you also foresee um, personal meetings. So all the structures and provisions which you want to set in place in order to manage and coordinate your partnership in an efficient way. But there is no need to um, um, foresee dedicated activities in the work plan for that. So it's more a descriptive information where you um, in, in, the, in the textbox um, section C7, where you explain and describe in a, in a coherent and clear way how you want to manage and coordinate your project. Thank you, Monica. The next question could actually come from me. Um, it's very structure oriented. <laughs> and it's something that I always ask myself as well. Mm -hmm. Should the working packages be arranged in process logic order, or can they be organized and performed simultaneously with the one summarizing uh, working package at the end? That's also a very good question, but I'm afraid there is no general answer to that. <laughs> so I think this will very much depend on um, the scope of the project and how it actually fits best to the, to the needs of the project. So it could, of course, be an option to have it all in a sequential way to do one task uh, or one, pack, pack, one work package after the other, which might be maybe a bit easier for the coordinator. Um, but it, there might be also reasons for conducting two work packages at the very same time. Um, and in this case, of course, you have to pay attention also to the interlinkages of different activities between work packages. And I think for this purpose, also you have in the application form an automatically generated work plan, where you which also then visualizes the timing of the different activities and the sequencing of outputs and deliverables. So, and in this sense, unfortunately, you have not seen GEMS so far because it's not available. But I believe that this automatically generated work plan can really be a good tool also for you to set up a good logic and good um, timing of the different activities. But overall, there is no rule or specific whatever recommendation whether to do a work plan in a sequential way or have more tasks in parallel. So I think this is really up to the project how it fits best to, to, the, to the needs of, of the specific partnership. Thank you, Monica. The next question is actually on communications. So I can give you a short break, Monica. I will bring you back Thank later you. <laughs> for more questions, for sure. Um, the next question is, 
is it advisable to have a communication activity within the work package in order to fulfill the communication objective, or is it enough to describe it in the activity description? So, as you know, or as you might know, you have to define your communication objective. Then how you actually reach this objective, there's many possible ways. And we wanted to give you the utmost level of freedom to do so. And whether you have to plan a standalone activity to reach this communication objective that you set, or whether you just, as I said also in the last webinar, or in the tutorial uh, that you can also watch on our YouTube playlist. If you want, um, you can also have a certain activity only as part of uh, another activity. Let's say an activity um, is, uh, you have a pilot action as an activity, for, uh, for example, something that leads to, um, or you have, uh, you have a thematic activity. You could then just foresee uh related communication activities in that thematic activity description box without having an addition towards one and the same thing then it might make sense also to have a standalone activity so it's really up to you there's no right or wrong um i'm afraid we are saying this quite often today but this is also the chance for you to convince us in the application form um, that this is the best way that you deem um, or this is where you think this is the best way to go ahead for reaching a thematic objective and also for reaching a communication objective. So I hope this answered the question. The next one is then talking about pilot actions is um, for my colleague Christoph, I would say. Hello, Christoph. Good morning. Uh, good morning to the audience. So, Christoph, let's dive right into the question. Um, it has to do with pilot uh, investment, investment in pilot installations. What if an organization which wants to invest in a pilot installation and it is the owner of the pilot site does not want to participate as a project partner? Can other partners from the same country can other partners, now I have to read the last, uh, can other partners from the same country, and is it, is it linked to the owner invest into the pilot? Ah, I, I, you read the question. I think you got it. Uh, yes. I hope the audience as well. Yeah, well, basically it's the question whether a partner can implement the pilot on a site with the partners not owning. Um, well, in general, the pref it's preferred that the site is owned by the respective partner participating in the project. Um, this is simply because this shows that the partnership has the implementation competences for the activities foreseen in the project. And at the same time, it shows the commitment of the respective partners to actually do what is foreseen in the project. Because if it's done by a partner, which is or like an, a stakeholder outside of the project, um, it is rather difficult to demonstrate that this um, pilot investment will actually take place and that they wish to have this pilot investment on their site. However, um, if there is no other way around, there is a possibility to indeed implement um, uh, a pilot action on a site which is not owned by the partner uh, and to have, for example, some equipment installed there. Um, but then there is a necessity to have a long-term legal, legal uh, agreement in order to ensure the durability and the maintenance of uh, the equipment, for example, which has been installed on that site. Thank you, Christoph. The next one is an uh, interesting one. Um, it's also kind of, of course, it helps to get some examples to illustrate better what is a bad pilot action. So what kind of pilot action would we never support? Do you Can you give some examples here? Yeah. The problem is always with examples is that uh, that uh, you narrow down a lot what what is actually possible and the pilot action can change from one topic to another. Um, so in order to answer to this question, I'd like to rather say what actually makes a good pilot action and then you can deduct 
that you should not turn the things around and do the opposite of that. Um, maybe just also to, to underline that uh, pilot actions are really key features in, in our projects. Um, you've seen that we have four different output types. Pilot actions is one of them. And we really see that uh, pilot actions often lead to very concrete results and are, as I said, key features. So a good pilot action should be, first of all, clearly transnational. Um, we have been also in the last Q&A session re been referring a lot to this Annex 6, where you have the definition of, uh, of uh, our output indicators. And in there, you can see that the pilot actions need to be jointly developed and jointly implemented. Uh, so this is a must. And the idea behind this is that the pilot action should lead to a transnational a learning of the partnership at transnational level. Then, as a second point, um, a pilot action needs to be clearly uh, having a experimental or demonstrating character. So it should test something or experiment something in a given territory uh, to look whether it works, so to look whether uh, it's at its feasibility uh, and its effectiveness. And in this setting, it should be innovative, innovative, new for this territory. As such, a pilot action should also be limited in its scope. So it should not be lasting from the first day of the project until the last day of the project. Uh, and it needs to be focused because you need to, to test something concretely in order to learn something out of it. Overall, the pilot action needs to be embedded in the overall work plan. Um, because again, you have these learnings from the pilot, which should be integrated somewhere else, like for example, in a solution. Um, and then a pilot needs to be clearly linked to uh, the achievement uh, of the project specific objective as defined in the work package and also contribute to the achievement of the overall project goal. Um, so these are some cornerstones which make a good pilot action and the bad, a bad pilot action will actually uh, be not fulfilling one or even several of these points um, which are very important to be taken into consideration when developing a pilot action and integrating it into your work plan. Thank you, Christoph. I, I fully agree with you. It's better to talk about something that is good and what we want to see than what we do not want to see. And in the end, it's also clear what we do not want to see then. So the next one is again on pilot actions. Um, here we have the case that a pilot action is actually focused on the implementation of citizens' involvement uh, practices. This, the question then is the solution that is linked to that. Does that have to be, can this be the detailed design of a service that does not yet exist in that territory? Or must it be the actual implementation of the service? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, I think it's very good to highlight uh, that the this question correctly points out that the solution needs to be derived from the pilot action. That's really something which is very important. So first you need to work on your pilot action, get your learnings and integrate these learnings in a joint process where you develop them together with your partnership, the, the respective solution. The solution should include already the elements and information on the actions needed for this solution to be taken up or to be upscaled. However, it does not need to be implemented yet. So this is uh, for the question. The actual uptake and the upscaling of uh, the solution, this is actually something which is then to be covered uh, uh, with a, in the respective uh, result indicator, which is solutions taken up or upscaled by organizations, uh, where you again can find the, um, the definition in the Annex 6 to the uh, uh, program manual, where you have all the indicator definitions. And of course, this uptake and upscaling, again, needs to be documented somewhere. Uh, and this documentation can and then again be integrated in your work plan. Thank you. The next one, again, on the, on the pilot actions and the, the, the outputs then linked to that, I think. If a pilot action consists um, of the experimentation of participatory democracy processes on the, in the same policy sector in two different countries, and if the co-design of the methodology is done together by the partnership, can this then be counted as a joint strategy? Yeah. 
I actually had seen this question and um, it was not fully clear to me because somehow this question is mixing two different output types. So uh, it is mixing the pilot actions and their implementation with the strategy development. So maybe to say, first of all, um, a pilot action, as I was mentioning before, it should test something innovative, something experimental in, in a given territory, which could be these participatory processes. Um, in order to be counted uh, as a pilot action, uh, it should be, uh, following the definition also in the Annex 6, be jointly developed, which could be, for example, this methodology being referred to, but it also needs the joint implementation. So it really needs both elements where you have partners from at least two countries being, developed, uh, being involved in the development of the pilot action and the implementation uh, through a co-creation, peer review and exchange during the, the process of the pilot action implementation. So uh, my saying on this would be rather a pilot action should be counted then as a pilot action. And if you want to work on a strategy, uh, of course, you can integrate the learnings later on in a strategy as well. Um, but th these are two different output types. And in order to go more into depth, of this uh, issue, I would rather uh, advise um, to come and have a uh, individual consultation with our colleagues here at the Joint Secretariat, because uh, there uh, we can then discuss to see how this entire process of the pilot action and strategy development process is embedded in the overall project, and we can give their further advice. Thank you, Christoph. We have a last one for you on pilot actions. And this has to do with the chronological order. Um, so the question is, is it possible to have a pilot action after a solution was developed? In this ca specific case uh, of the person asking, they firstly come up with a solution and then they plan to test the, uh, this solution through a pilot action to verify it. Mm -hmm. Well, this, uh, if I take the exact wording of the, this question, the answer would be no because a, a solution and the definition as we have it in this program needs to be derived from a pilot action. So you can develop already in advance some draft tools, some services, uh, which you are then testing in your pilot action. But the, 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 these preparatory elements which you want to test, they are not yet counted as an output. You, you don't forget in, in, in your work plan, you have a series of activities and each activity needs to be documented at least by one deliverable. So you can have preparatory activities where you are going to, to shape your, your, your tools, concepts, ideas, services, which you want to then test later in the follow-up activity. Um, and this testing is then your actually first output, which would be then your pilot action. And then your final solution derived from the learnings this is then only coming afterwards, and this is then again an output. So in this setting, you would have two outputs. One output is the pilot action, and one output is the derived solution, which comes after the pilot action. Thank you, Christoph. This is crystal clear, I think. Thank you. So much on pilot actions, etc. So thank you, Christoph, for the time being. The next question is actually directed uh, and me and Monica, I would say. So Monica, maybe I can ask you to come back already. The question is uh, about the communication work package um, that is missing and whether a partnership can specify a partner and allocate more budget to that partner, obviously, because this person will be a crucial person in the project. They will have to coordinate all communications. So my answer would be very simple. Um, yes, you can specify this, but because you are the master of the application form more than I am, Monica, you can probably say in which section, because I'm not sure I know the number, but in the partner section, there is a field where you can indicate um, whether uh, a certain partner is taking over the role as called a communication coordinator. And the same is also true for other roles, I understand. You're perfectly right, Frank. So, of course, the partner section uh, should explain for the respective partner 
whether he's the one um, taking over this lead of, of the communication at, at, pro at project level. But um, I want to point also again to the section C7, which is linked to management and also communication. And there is also one dedicated text box where you should describe also the overall communication approach. And I think there is also the possibility or space that you can clearly indicate also who is taking this lead in communication and link to the budget. But I think budget questions, they will come afterwards. But more in general terms, of course, if this um, partner is taking uh, over responsibilities and activities for communication, these activities, the cost for these commun um, communication activities, of course, need to be reflected also in the partner budgets. That's clear, as for any other activities. And then it always depends on which simplified cost option you choose, uh, how you build your budget, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm sure uh, we will come back to this uh, in, in uh, this webinar a little bit later. Monica, I have another question for you. It has to do with the um, jointly developed solutions and there is a question, what do we actually mean when we say that these jointly developed solutions should not have as their main focus administrative or legal frameworks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. And I see that also um, the person who has posed this question has um, very thoroughly read also Annex 6 on the indicator definitions and this I find really good since Christoph was pointing also already several times at this Annex 6, which contains all the indicator definitions. But maybe more in general terms, um, solutions, we see it actually something which is more implementation oriented. So this means solutions, they can be um, tools which have been tested, services, concepts, whatever. And they can, of course, have some policy or administrative related aspects, but they should not purely concentrate on such admin or legal issues. So this means solutions should be something rather practical, rather implementation oriented. And this is also um, due to their nature because they have been tested in pilot actions before, as was emphasized by Christoph very much in detail before. Thank you, Monica. I think this is clear. I can tell people are reading our documents more or all of them have, most of them have read the documents more thoroughly probably than in the first webinar. I think it shows also the development stage of the proposals with these many questions on the pilot actions that we had. Mm -hmm. And now we are also getting some more questions on indicators. And um, sometimes our wording does not seem to be so clear and in this case it has to do with the uh i think it's rcr common result indicator 79 where it reads it is not necessary that all actions identified in a joint strategy or action plan are taken up for such a strategy or action plan to be counted under this indicator how shall we understand this mm -hmm. yeah first to say for us at the program, it's very important that strategies, they are not only drafted, that they are not only developed by the partnership, but they're, that they are really brought to life. And this, um, and this uptake or bringing to life, it should ideally start already during project implementation or mostly rather at the end of the project, I would assume. But of course, this uptake, it's a process. So I think it, um, it's not really very likely or very probable that um, the project they will manage to have a full uptake of the full strategy with all the different actions already by the end of the project. So this is why also the definition of this indicator says that the uptake should at least have started. And this means that if a strategy, for instance, I don't know, contains 10 different actions, even if they have started with the uptake of one action, it could be already or it can be already included and reported under this indicator. And of course, it might also happen that the other nine actions, they will be then taken up maybe a few years even later, which of course also relates to the long-term impact 
uh, projects they want to have. So I think this is also something where we want to have a view on what is happening after the project. And it might be also the case that maybe not all 10 actions of the strategy, they might be even relevant at the very end. So could be also that maybe at the end, only nine out of the 10 are taken up. For us, in order to be counted under this indicator, at least um, the uptake should have started and at least um, some of the actions, they need to be taken up. Okay. Of course, in the ideal case, everything would be taken up. <laughs> I don't know if it is the ideal case and whether you can count everything when it comes to the next question, because here the question is, when you count the number of organizations formally cooperating in the project, what do we actually mean by formally? Do you just count any organization or um, do we have certain rules for formally? Mm -hmm. I think there is a very easy answer to this question, and the answer is also stated in the um, Annex 6. So this means this formal cooperation is between project partners within the partnership. This means the beneficiaries of the project plus the associated institutions. So there is a very clear definition to that. And this indicator is actually already fulfilled as soon as the subsidy contract is concluded and um, the partnership agreement is signed. So this means this is the formal establishment of this cooperation um, as such. And um, the reason for also including this um, indicator is that um, I think um, also at European level and also at program level, there is really this um, emphasis on cooperation and making cooperation also visible um, through this very basic indicator, which is actually the starting point for all the other activities to be carried out in a joint way and in a transnational cooperation approach. Thank you, Monica. We heard already before for the pilot actions that in our program, and I think all across Interreg, it is very crucial for us that deliverables are jointly developed. So. On this one, we have the next question then. What does it mean, this joint development um, of deliverables? Does this mean uh, that a partnership should probably select and define the output cooperation in all, in the, in all the work packages, or is this going too far? Um, coming back to um, our output types. So this means the development of strategies, um, development and implementation of um, pilot actions and solutions. It is one of the requirements that they have been um, developed and for the pilot actions also in being implemented in a, in, a, in, a, in a joint way. And joint in this sense means that they have been um, conducted um, at least together from two different organizations from two different countries. And of course, there are different ways of doing this joint development or joint um, implementation. For instance, by uh, exchanging experiences, doing peer reviews, doing um, um, working in a co-creation approach. So, and this is really, really crucial. And um, as I said before, cooperation should be at the heart of each project. Of course, there could be also some activities which are more whatever linked to one partner, but especially this exchange and speaking to each other and um, involving other partners. This is one of the assets and one of the crucial elements. Okay, we are slowly coming to an end of this uh, question and answer round, Monica. I have like one or two more questions maybe for you before we move mm -hmm. into uh, budget. So we become a little bit more general again on the work plan, which is also good. Is a green paper concrete enough to qualify for, uh, in, in terms of policy implementation, to be considered as a strategy or action plan? And what is meant in practice by corresponding by the corresponding result indicator, which is uh, which the 
um, strategies and action plans which are adopted and implemented by organizations during or shortly after the project completion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it really um, depends on a case by case which documents um, could really prove this adoption or uptake um, by the organizations. What we actually need um, is some sort of evidence or proof that um, these strategies, they are being adopted. And this might be very much different also from case to case. For instance, it could be a memorandum of understanding. It could be a, a formal agreement between partners. It could be maybe in this case, also depending on the, on the scope of the project. Um, such a paper, but this is really something which needs to be seen on a case by case basis. What is um, the requirement for being counted under these result indicators is that there is a formal evidence that this uptake or adoption has been taken place or will take place shortly after project closure. But for this, I think also, as pointed out before, um, individual consultations, they can give maybe more guidance also on the specific um, project scope, which type of agreements or papers might be the most suitable ones for such cases. Thank you. Then I have a very easy and straightforward question for you, Monica. And I think once we have gems up and running, such questions will answer uh, themselves because the system will guide you also in certain ways um, when, um, when you develop and um, when you are about to submit the application, you will also get a quick test whether all the necessary fields were filled in. So here, the question is, is it necessary to define specific objectives for all work packages? There is a clear yes. There has to be one specific work packet, one, one specific objective for each thematic work package. And this um, shows also then the intervention logic. Uh, of the whole project. So this means that you have to define project objectives and they have to then, then be um, addressed by um, the respective work package, the activities and the outputs. So with this, you can clearly establish the link between activities, what you want to do, which should um, lead to the fulfillment or, or the achievement of the uh, work of the specific objective which are then um, 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 described in the frame of a, of a dedicated white package. Thank you, Monica. And the very last question for this round um, is linked to the results of a project. If a project generates new results, do they all have to be made available or can they just be held back and be used by certain partners after the project? or even during the project, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this relates very much to the questions which we had already before, which was linked to intellectual property rights, um, which are um, tackled also in the subsidy contract. But with this, I might hand over maybe again also to Luca, uh, who can say maybe something on this um, um obligation or not obligation any longer to make everything um available to the public so with this we can maybe close also somehow the circle um which we had um, um with this information which we have had already um addressed in the beginning thank you very much monica maybe christoph uh you want to um come back very briefly so thank you also to you, Christoph, for answering all these questions in this round. Now that you're through with this, and uh, hopefully the next uh, panelists that I will invite here are not listening now, um, you have been answering questions to more than 600 people. So <laughs> probably it didn't feel like this, but uh, this is the audience that we have today. So thank you for answering all these questions and I hope we have inspired and could help further our participants. Thank you. So with that, I think we can then move on into the third and final round of today's webinar. And in this round, 
we will look into your questions on project budget development and state aid. And we have two seasoned experts for this round who were also answering the questions already in the first webinar. We have Helga Portelli, our head of finance, and Christina Glumatz, Glumatz for state aid issues. Let's take a look into a first question. So the first question is, if a partner chooses the simplified cost option flat rate for direct costs other than staff costs, which is 40% of eligible direct staff costs, does this partner then still need to specify in the application form how the 40% are spent for all other costs and how they are divided between cost categories? Helga, welcome to this webinar today. Hello. Good morning, Frank, and good morning also to our followers. So, Helga, I have, um, I, I, I assume I know the answer, but now I'm uh, entering slippery uh, ground when it comes to my personal expertise. So, I'm very glad to have you here. Um, I'm pretty sure you have a very clear and direct answer. Yes. Uh, when this simplified cost option is selected, all the partner has to do is include the staff costs in the application form and automatically the 40% is calculated. There is no need to provide information at how this 40% is divided within the other cost categories. The only thing is that if the partner foresees to have an investment, then it is uh, recommended that this investment is explained in the relevant section of the application form. Very good. That's the beauty of a flat rate, I think. So can an SME, the next question, can an SME that participates in a consortium contribute, contribute its co-financed part in kind? Maybe you can also say a word on what in kind is because yes, not I everyone would, might not understand this. I would divide this a bit in, in, in two. I've seen that this question has come up a number of times and it's also received quite a number of thumbs up. So I think there is a bit of a misconception here. I just want to first of all say that when it comes to in kind contributions, there is a specific definition in the regulation of what in kind contributions are. And this is usually referred to unpaid voluntary work, unpaid services, unpaid, but what is something which is unpaid. Uh, this is with regards to in kind, but I want to, it is very important, it seems that there is a misconception. It is very important for the beneficiaries to understand that the Interreg Central Europe program follows the principle of reimbursement of costs. Uh, incurred by the beneficiary and paid by the beneficiary. So in practical terms, this means that each beneficiary has to pre-finance all the costs. And then once this is done for every period, the costs are submitted to the controllers, controllers verify the costs, and then they are included in a joint finance report and the um, after some checks, this is paid 80% of this amount, so 80% ERDF, is paid to the lead partner and then it is transferred to the partner according to the, to the reports. So the, the idea of paying in kind part of only the 20% is, uh, is fallacious in, in, in this case because it is that each beneficiary has to first pre-finance everything and then get a reimbursement according to the period. I hope that I was clear enough in this answer. You know, if, if you were not clear enough, I would just ask our, our viewers, our followers to post another question, a follow-up question on this, uh, if there's the need. As you said, this was really upvoted, this question. So there might be certain elements that are still unclear in this uh, important issue also. So let's see whether you covered all the ground needed or whether there's more coming a little bit later. 
So the next question for the moment has to do um, with the link between the budget and what the project does. So in the partner budget section B17, when it is necessary to insert the budget lines, is it possible to refer to the deliverables in the description? So basically, uh, the budget is inserted, that's right, in section B17. And for certain cost categories, that is cost category uh, four to six, external expertise and services costs, equipment and infrastructure and works. For these type of costs, items, there has to be a description given. And the description should be clear enough to be linked to the activities in the work plan. But there is no need to specifically say it is for this activity or something like that. It is from the description, it has to be clear enough to which activity it relates. Okay, thank you, Helga. The next one has to do with project management. So if an LP, a lead partner, would like to externalize some parts of the project management work, um, and if they want to procure, pay, and declare the invoices of the provider, um, then the question is, do they, uh, can, can they um, ask their partners to contribute to the 20% co-financing? Can they set up a compensation reimbursement system outside the project? finances because this is obviously the budget of the partner and not the ERDF uh, financing and that well, creates I'm, costs. For, for this uh, question I would like to point out that when a benefit, I mean this was also mentioned previously in, in the very first round when Luca was was answering questions that when a beneficiary takes the responsibility to be the lead partner of a project it commits itself to all the obligations that are listed in our program documents, specifically the subsidy contract. So the league partner takes over the obligation to manage the project and the partnership, and it should have sufficient financial resources to do so and to cover the 20% co-financing. I think we, one has to think about the spirit of cooperation here as well. Okay, um, we are getting a lot of likes for the finance questions. So people are upvoting many, many of the questions. One that is really upvoted a lot is the next one. I can see 26 people have been upvoting this one. So the investments of over 25,000 euros, infrastructure and equipment, does this actually mean 25,000 at the project level or at the partner level? It is at partner level because each investment in reality should be carried out by one single partner. So when a partner has uh, equipment and infrastructure and works which is above 25,000 and they are related to an investment, then this has to be uh, specified in the application form. But this is a partner level and not a project level. Thank you, Erika. That is very clear. Can associated partners be subcontracted for a certain activity during the project lifetime? This was also, I think, a popular question, not only with likes, but also it was repeated, I think, twice. Uh, associated partners are not financing partners. And they uh, are not precluded from taking part in procurement procedures. The most important thing is that the financing partners, um, they would um, have follow the procurement rules. That is, is, is vital there. And something important to mention, of course, is the, the principle of transparency. I mean, these associated partners might have a bit uh, more inside information than other partners, which might create a bit of, you know, it would be difficult to show that yeah, there. But it is possible for, for associated partners to take part in and provide their bid for in during procurement. Thank you, Helga. Let's uh, look, move up the, the whole level once more. It's about budget limitations for particular for, for the four priorities that we have. 
and I think this has to do, if I'm not mistaken, with the total uh, project budgets. Are there any limitations for costs? No, there are absolutely no limitations that we say this particular project should be, there are no limitations. It's always that the budget uh, should always reflect what the activities are. We have certain recommendations, I think. No? There are certain kind recommendations of, like... of how, how big the budget should be, how big a project should be. This is, yes, sure. Yeah. There are recommendations, but this does not mean that uh, projects which are uh, above these recommendations or below these recommendations are not um, taken into account or something like that, or are penalized because of that. Okay. Can external stakeholders receive financial compensation for their work within the stakeholders group from a project partner budget? Here we're talking about externals, and this means that it is uh, work done externally from the project partnership. Whenever one subcontracts, procurement rules have to be abided by. I come again to the, to the famous uh, topic of procurement rules, because in order to pay the work of an external, then procurement rules have to be followed. And as long as this is followed, then yes, it is fine. And such costs would be under cost category four. OK, the next one, in case the budget for travel allocated to a certain activity would not be sufficient to cover all the effective costs. Is it allowed to shift part of the budget of another activity to cover those costs? In this programming period, travel and accommodation costs is, uh, can only be a flat rate which is a flat rate according to uh, it's, it's at country level. So depending where the partner comes from, there is a flat rate that is automatically calculated once staff costs. So this, this uh, flat rate is based on staff costs and it is automatically calculated once there is staff costs. So it is not, since it's no longer on a real cost basis, there is no this thing of um, moving budget from one to the other to, to cover this cost. It's a flat rate with that amount that you receive you have to cover the costs related to travel and accommodation. Thank you, Helga. It has its advantages and disadvantages, obviously. To it's also a bit difficult to, to come to terms with these simplified cost options until you start using them. Then I think the beneficiaries, once they start using them, they realize how uh, yeah, simple they are in reality. Helga. I can give you a break unless you would like to answer state aid questions now. I leave that to Christina. <laughs> I leave that to the expert. <laughs> so thank you for the moment, Helga. And Christina, may I ask you to join me here? Hello, Christina. Hello, Frank. Hello, everyone participating in today's question and answer session. So, Christina, it's a bit like with Christoph, you know, uh, state aid becomes a lot easier to understand when you get some examples. <laughs> So after reading the program's manual and watching your tutorial on state aid, we feel the topic needs more elaboration with practical examples. This is the statement from uh, an applicant out there. So all the five conditions that describe the state aid applicable to any SME, and the question is coming from an SME, how does that affect their budgeting um, in view of the entire project that is below 2 million euros? Yeah, I have to say that it comes as no surprise that this was one of the most voted questions because of the complex the complexity of the topic. And indeed, because it's such a complex topic, complex topic, we have prepared separate chapter in the program manual tutorial on state aid. There is also help desk for um, uh, state aid questions and also dedicated section in frequently asked questions. But before answering the uh, question posed, um, let me stress out that our program is a transnational cooperation program. So meaning that we are looking for uh, uh, transnational projects which bring changes to territories. We are focusing on developing and piloting solution, building capacities, uh, facilitating knowledge transfer. We are not program intended to give subsidies to companies. Still, since we are granting ERDF funds based on the monitoring uh, committee decisions, we have to comply with the stated rules and we need to assess 
uh, project proposals for stated risk and existence of stated. In this respect, it is very important what applicants provide in the application form. So I bring again to their attention section uh, B, where they also describe, I think it's uh, 1.6, where they describe, describe what there is their relevance, what they are bringing, which competencies they are bringing to the project, but also their daily, daily uh, business activities. And as pointed out in the question, there are five conditions given in the treaty on the in the treaty on the function of EU, uh, where um, against which we assess project proposals. And focus here is on selective advantage given to undertakings which they would not obtain under usual market conditions. SME being a project partner does not automatically mean there will be state aid granted to, to them. Also, if project proposal does not include SMEs, that doesn't mean that there is no state aid and that none of the project partners will receive state aid. How they should budget then their, uh, their project budget, this limitation of 2 million applies under GBA regulation if there is state aid to be granted, ERDF to be granted a state aid, 2 million euros per undertaking, per project partner, per project. So historical data in Central Europe projects showed that they have usually much less project, uh, 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 project partners have much less budget than 2 million euros. And like it was already pointed out, um, budget needs to be coherent with project activities and needs to follow what has been planned in the uh, section C4 and uh, section C7. I hope I didn't take too much time to try to provide a, a simple question to such a complex, uh, simple answer to such a complex uh, a question. I, I, I believe that your expertise is very much needed. It's a very complex topic. And even within the JS, I think uh, you're one of two persons that really masters state aid. And the rest of us, we just have some rudimentary knowledge uh, and we always run to you to ask what uh, is right and what is wrong so i think there cannot be an answer too long on this topic so we have another one do companies have to provide information and declare previously received state aid i think you touched on that a little bit already but uh, yes. maybe just to clarify so this depends under which regulation we grant state aid. If we are applying and framing state aid under GBER, General Block Exemption Regulation, there is no declaration needed uh, because the threshold of 2 million euros of direct aid, aid to project partners, is applicable on project level, so per project. Also, this uh, applies for indirect aid framed under Article 20A, uh, 20,000 euros per undertaking per project for indirect state aid. This is aid given to third parties which are not participating in the project proposal as project partners. However, in some exceptional cases, we might apply the minimis regime. And since the threshold given in the minimis is per member state and also in the time frame of three fiscal years, then we would collect declarations in the contracting phase. Declarations of how much state aid under the minimis was previously received. Okay, thank you very much for this. A very concrete uh, case is the next one, and I think this is also applicable to, to probably many uh, project partnerships. So, as part of the project, this project partner wants to implement and test a digital solution that can be used by SMEs. So, the question is, is it possible to make this tool commercially available after the end of the project as a contribution to the maintenance and management of the tool? Um, the regul none of the regulations gives any provision actually on revenue. So in pra <clears throat> practical terms, um, there should be no limitations. That is answer is yes. Um, however, there could be state aid. Uh, there will probably be state aid conditions and limitations in such case. Um, here, maybe it's good to bring to the attention of our applicants what was also previously mentioned, a uh, self-assessment check tool or um, uh, terms of reference where we include questions, uh, guiding questions for the assessment. And please pay attention that um, long last um, effects and transferability of outputs and results is also one of the questions for assessing project proposals. Okay, thank you. Next one is also about the digital tool. It's um, a question if the digital tool, like an app uh, that they would like to develop within the project, uh, 
it's a kind of a booking system for booking accommodation services, um, whether it does not constitute state aid in the sense of promotion of private services uh, providers by such projects financed by public funding. Um, if we are speaking, if we are speaking and having a case of promotion of certain undertakings, so selective, selectively giving advantage, there would be uh, a case of state aid. However, this information is quite limited to say whether this kind of project proposal will have state aid or not for sure. So other elements are important. Still, giving selecting advantage to certain undertakings, not to all, is a state aid risk and probably there would be state aid granted. All right. Um, then I think there is a last question for you, Christina. If a partner has already participated to a central um, EU project in the last three years with a budget of 200,000 euros in total. How do this, how will the state aid rules be applied if the same partner will join a new consortium in this call? Um, let me go back to um, the minimis regime. So this stated threshold applies per member state and uh, in the time frame of three fiscal years, um, we will largely apply general block exemption regulation, Article 20, which allows us to, in case state aid relevant and ERDF is to be granted as state aid, which allows us to give up to 2 million euros uh, per project partner uh, per project. So um, two points to uh, uh, to make to have clear in this respect, uh, we would apply GBER in case not possible and there will be public contribution for co-financing, for partners co-financing. Uh, then we take a look from which member state they received and in which time frame. So uh, if it's not in the past, in the time frame of three fiscal years, then this uh, project applicant could potentially receive also under the minimis. But as I said, uh, certain conditions have to be respected. And um, we think that application of GBER and framing state aid under GBER brings significant uh, simplification for partners potential uh, uh, future partners. Thank you, Christina. For the time being, this was it on state aid. Let's see if there's more coming. And the next questions are on finance again. Helga, hello. Here I am again. So I have a first question for you, which is, um, I remember very well um, this hierarchy of rules and i think this question is very much linked to this if i'm not mistaken so here the question is in the case of selecting budget option three the flat rate 40 percent of staff costs if the national requirements are relatively liberal for selecting a subcontractor and if these are fulfilled what about the central europe requirements um are there any other requirements to be followed or is it fine if it meets the national requirements it's interesting to see how much uh, interest there is in this 40% simplified cost option. It is important to note that when this option is chosen, there is no need, when, when reporting to the controller, there will be no need for any documentation to be presented for this 40%. However, of course, even though you do not have to show procurement that you have followed procurement rules, it is important to say that uh, if you are a beneficiary that falls within the scope of procurement rules, then procurement rules should be applied. So we do not want to say that you don't have to do anything. The only thing is that towards the program and towards the controller, you do not have to show anything. But if at national level you have to follow procurement rules, please do follow them because otherwise you might be anyway in trouble because I mean, ultimately you get 80% plus 20% would be financed also through your, your institution or through other sources. Right, thank you, Helga, for this. Then we are coming back to the uh, project management. And I suppose um, in many ways, uh, this is probably also true for many other activities. So considering that no activities related to project management are now part of the work plan. 
where should the costs be included? For instance, where should they uh, include the costs of the first level control? Okay, I think this 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 change in not having work packages uh, is is creating quite a bit of uncertainty here. Uh, the budget is included at cost category, at partner, cost category, and period level. So uh, even though you do not have the work packages, the budget has to, has to be um, built in a way to make sure that it includes all your activities, including management. Now, I mean, this specifically makes reference to where should I put the costs of the first level controller? A first level controller, depending, I mean, if it is an external first level controller, then it is included under the cost category for external expertise and services. And there you would have a place where to put the description where you would say, this is the cost related to uh, control costs. So it's, I think this, there is a bit of a fear with the, where, where to include the cost. And maybe from my end, I would recommend that even though um, the budget in the application form is only at, uh, there is no work package level, I would say that when you are preparing your budget outside GEMS, you should foresee to make the, the budget in, in kind of work packages so that you make sure that you do not forget anything out. But then all you have to do insert in the in gems would be the budget at the cost category level and divide it per period. Thank you, Helga. Um, if there are more questions on this, or, I, mean, I would again like to point out the individual consultations, of course, um, for, for questions like this also, um, but I think that's also overall um, well explained. Thank you very much, Helga. So we have a final question for you, Helga, because uh, there are some more questions, but we have the feeling that many of those are touching on the same issues that we discussed already. So for those uh, that have the feeling that it is actually something different, please address also the help desk. Mm. Um, we can then come back to you individually. But for this webinar session, we are slowly coming to an end. And the last question for you, Helga, that we have for today on finances is has to do with um, what is written on page 38 of our program manual. The full purchase cost of the equipment can be regarded as eligible. However, also depreciation is eligible if in line with national rules on the matter. Under which circumstances do our full purchase um, is the full per our full purchase costs eligible instead of uh, depreciation? I think I know this, this has from uh, just maybe this reminds me of uh, filing my tax uh, my tax request because I, sometimes you have the same issues here. So I'm very curious to hear how we handle this. Yeah, I think this has already also been asked during the first. Q&A session that we had, so it seems that it still uh, is not uh, that clear. Um, as a program rule, the full cost is eligible if the equipment is used for project purposes. So that is the general rule. However, there are times when uh, it is not possible for the institution to account it in full because of their own rules that it would have to be depreciated. So in that case, if it is not possible in some way to put the full cost to the project, then it is possible to depreciate the cost and depreciation costs are also eligible in that case. But as a general principle, it's the full cost of the equipment which is eligible within the project. Thank you, Helga. Sorry, there was a slight lag in the in the connection here. So thank you very much for for so for this so far. Um, as I said, uh, anyways, behind the help desk, when uh, you have more finest questions and when they become a bit more uh, complex, it's anyways Helga and her team answering these questions. So uh, do not be shy. Drop us an email to the help desk or bring these questions up also in the in the video consultations. 
Thank you, Helga. And then Thank I will you. have a very last question for today. Or actually, I see that there's one more question then uh, coming in for Christina also. So let's start with Luca, nevertheless. Luca, I have a question for you. So welcome back. There is a question, and we are now going back, and we are, um, we are staying within financing, obviously, um, but we are also going back to a more general level. Uh, one of our uh, participants today uh, read that there are, might be a possible state co-financing of the remaining 20%, for example, in Italy. Um, what is the situation so far? What do we know? Um, what, is, what is happening with this Fondo? Coesione, rotazione, you will be more familiar with this then. Yeah, uh, well, the point is that um, I take it on a more general level, let's put it in this way, because this is a question concerning Italy, where there is this automatic co-financing for, for beneficiaries given by the Fondo di Rotazione. However, also, other countries have set up national co-financing schemes, which cover in full or in part this 20%. Um, basically, you have to ask your contact points in your countries, how is the situation for the national co-financing? Uh, coming back to the Italian question, I know this, there will be this Fondo di Rotazione, but I honestly don't know whether the details have been already published, whether it covers only the public or the public and the privates. Please address your contact points. Uh, I want to emphasize anyway that whenever there is a public co-financing to project expenditure, and if there is state aid, then we have to be a little bit careful because in this case, we cannot grant GBER and then the, all the big issue of accumulation of, of, uh, uh, of uh, grant received in the previous three years up to a threshold of 200,000 applies. But maybe for this, I'm sure that Christina could give some more information. Thank you, Luca. And Christina, maybe you can jump in and then I would have another question for you anyways. I am back and I see, Frank, maybe you can already read the question because it does actually connect with the um, answer given by Luca and what is to be presented. Yeah, this question is, how do I know if the minimis will be given to me or through uh, uh, or Jiba? Sorry. So like um, Luca already pointed out, in some countries, there might be co-financing secured for partners part in the budget for 20, like a part, a contribution to partners budget. Uh, this needs to be also reflected in the application form. So please, for all applicants, uh, potential beneficiaries, project, future uh, project partners, please make sure that the information on the source of your contribution this 20% is correctly inserted or correct information is provided in the application form. Namely, uh, as previously stated, um, if we grant ERDF as stated under GBER regulation, uh, project partners cannot receive any other public co-financing because total support cannot, public support cannot exceed 80%. And to answer this question, how the partner knows whether in case they are state aid relevant, whether they will receive state aid under the minimis regime or we will apply GBER, this will be clarified in the contracting phase. But for sure, make sure that information in the application form on the public uh, of the external public contribution, which project partner may intend to receive, whether it's going to be automatic public co financing for the total. Uh, uh, partner contribution or partially or whether they intend to apply for some public contribution, external public contribution, this information is very relevant, but anyhow will be clarified in the contracting phase. I hope this answers the question and that it's also uh, uh, a follow up to Luca's answer. Perfect, Christina. Thank you very much. 
We are jumping around a little bit because your questions are coming in uh, on various topics now and you're upvoting certain questions. So, Christina, I believe this might have been it on state aid. So, thank you very much. And for a brief moment, we would like to move back into finances because we have a very rather basic question here, which has been upvoted quite a lot. So, I do not want to uh, drop this from this webinar. Helga, Good to see you back. Sorry for bringing you back quickly. We have a question, which is, uh, what does it mean that ERDF co-financing rate is 80%? Could you please explain this um, for, for those that are really probably new to the to EU funds and co-financing rates? Yeah, this is quite, I suppose, a basic question. So it seems that it comes from someone who is quite uh, new to, to the program. So uh, the projects are co-financed through the European Regional Development Fund. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, each beneficiary would first have to pre-finance the activities. And then when, these, uh, when the costs are reported to the controllers and verified by the controllers and then reported to the program, the managing authority will pay back to the project, we pay to the lead partner who then distributes the amount to the partners. The 80%, so if you had a cost, let's say you had a, I don't know, an invoice of 1000 euros from the ERDF, from the program, you get back 80%, 800 euros back. And the rest is co-financed through either own sources or uh, through other uh, means of uh, financing. I hope this is because sometimes, you know, with basic questions, it is more difficult to 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 answer and say, yes, I hope that this answers the question that the person had. Absolutely. But if I'm not mistaken, <clears throat> at least in the past, we also had a flowchart of the reimbursement process in the program manual. I'm not sure if it is still in there. Yes, yes, there will, is. Yeah. There is in the program manual how the, um, the the financial flow goes, but I think it's really this from from the question I understand that it was not clear what this eighty percent is. So it yeah. is how much you get back from the program. Very good. Thank you very much for answering this. I hope it clarified this issue of uh, the eighty percent co-financing and the twenty percent uh, um, additional financing to come from the organization itself. Um, I would like to close today's webinar with a thematic, uh, a, not a thematic, but a rather um, a general question. And for this, I would like to bring Monica back. Hello, Monica. Hello. We have something, um, we have a question that has been upvoted quite a lot also on um, the output type solutions. This is also something that still seems to be a little bit unclear what exactly a solution can be. Of course, we have the uh, definitions um, in the glossary in the program manual for that. But um, when you think of it more concretely, there seems to be still some uncertainty. For example, could a solution be a set of policy recommendations? How would you define, how would you mm -hmm. differentiate this output type from others? Yeah, so I think we were already speaking about solutions before, but I think, yeah, asking for example, so solutions is actually a very wide um, term. So, and um, this is why we also, I think, explained in our manual that solutions, of course, they should be something innovative, so they should not be existing so far. And this is why um, we always emphasize that the solution comes at the end of a pilot action. But of course, it could be based on, or a solution could be derived from whatever, a draft procedure, an instrument, a technology, uh, a tool, which could be a method, a concept, a service. So I think um, it's, there are very wide possibilities what a solution could be so you it could be maybe also taking i don't know a, a technology a tool which has been maybe also developed in a different 
funding instrument. For instance, if linking back to the experience which we made in the previous, in the current program, in our fourth call, it was projects which were taking up, um, for instance, uh, some, some, some. I would not say results, but some some concepts or some tools which have been developed, for instance, in the Horizon pro program. And they were then further developed, adapted and capitalized and tested in um, other pilot actions. And I think similar could hold true. So there could be one option to develop such new whatever draft solutions or tools in the in uh, in a first step of, of a project or take already some existing ones, which will then be tested, verified, further adapted. And at the end, you have the solution, which is ready to for the uptake by institutions or by different regions. So yeah, it really depends on the scope of a project. So if you have, for instance, a, a project dealing with whatever circular economy, it could be, for instance, a specific technology or uh, uh, whatever installation, which maybe helps to close the loops within a, a company or within a region. If you take, for instance, I don't know, um, uh, a project dealing with environment as such, it could be maybe a novel whatever monitoring method in order to identify pollutants, for instance which would be then a solution which can be um, taken, taken up by maybe local or regional authorities. So there is really a, a high diversity of what could be really a solution. And this really very much depends on the thematic scope of the project and the specific objective under which this is placed. Thank you very much, Monica, for this answer. The more options you have and the broader the scope is, sometimes the more difficult it becomes to, to grasp the, the core of something. But I hope that your answer and the other answers that we gave you all today uh, will have, help you to solve many of the problems that you uh, face with developing a good application. So with this answer, thank you very much, Monica. I would like to close for today. Thank you very much for all your questions. And thank you very much to all my colleagues for sharing their knowledge and expertise. Thank you also to all other members of the JS team who were supporting this event in the background. In the coming weeks before the call closes, we will continue to support you in drafting your applications. As a first step, we will upload the recording of this event already tomorrow, if possible, the latest the day after tomorrow. Tomorrow, for sure, we will then also open the registration for our third and last Q&A webinar. It will take place again on this platform on the 4th of February, as I mentioned before. And in this, we plan to answer all your questions that you might have following the launch of the electronic submission system, GEMS, at the end of January. By the way, if you believe we could do something better next time, please tell us in the feedback form that we will also also sent to you soon after we close. Also by our national contact point network. In your country, there is always a person ready and willing to support you through a help desk and also um, on the transnational level, my colleagues in the JS are available for individual consultations. Please remember that they are offered only until the 11th of February. Secondly, be active in the applicant community. Stay in touch with each other and hold meetings to build and further improve your partnerships. And last but not least, and this has to do with the last uh, webinar that we will be holding soon, do not wait until the last minute with submitting your application. The submission system will go online soon. And from that day onwards, you can transfer all the information that you and your partners have gathered and prepared and put together already into the system. So thank you very much once more for attending this webinar today and all the best wishes for your proposal development. Have a good day. Goodbye.